All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, musos. We're going to get into it this morning. And uh, I, really, I, really need to, um, I really need to punch it this morning in regards to time. So we're going to speed up. Is that all right? We're just going to drop down to third and just accelerate a little bit. Now, generally, uh, often we'll preach uh, the Word of God, but in this next season that we're heading into, uh, we're going to head into a bit more of a teaching series, and, and we're going to just uh, dig a little bit deeper into the Word of God. Uh, so I'm going to try and do that in, uh, in 30 minutes. We're going to go a little bit deeper. It might go a little bit quicker. So I encourage you right now, pull out your phone, uh, pull out a notepad. You're going to need to take some notes uh, if you brought your Bible, great. We're going to be going through a whole chapter of the Bible this morning. Uh, this is something I tell young preachers not to do. I say, don't, you don't, don't preach too much. You have too much time to get through. But I'm going to break my own rule this morning and preach a whole chapter. Is that all right? Yeah. Uh, we're going to be, the theme of this month is rest. And what you need to understand about rest is that it's an empowerment, not a reprieve. It's an empowerment, not a reprieve. The way the gospel talks about rest is it's an empowerment, not a reprieve. We think in our Australian culture, rest is an ability for us to, you know, uh, put on our bodies and pluggers, go down the beach, have a few drinks, you know, rest and, and just relax. But that's not what the Bible means when it talks about rest. Rest is an empowerment, not a reprieve. The first time we see rest is in the Garden of Eden, and that was where Adam, by grace, was placed there in perfect presence, the presence of God, in full protection. He was protected by God, and he was also provided for presence, protection, and provision. They're the three most significant characteristics of rest. Adam obviously lost that rest through disobedience, and then God used the nation of Israel as a vehicle and a teaching tool to show his people that he wants them to enter rest. He wants them to go back into what Adam had, the rest of God. It wasn't just that God called the Egyptian, oh, sorry, the Israelites out of Egypt. He just didn't call them out. He also called them in. It wasn't, I'm just going to take you out of slavery. It was, I'm going to take you out of slavery and into my rest. Now, once again, Israel failed to do that. And in Hebrews, it clearly identifies the reasons why they failed to do that. There are two main reasons, a lack of faith and disobedience, a lack of faith and disobedience. In other words, God has prepared a rest for his people, but it is possible to not enter into that rest because of a lack of faith and disobedience. Now, we are fortunate because we have entered that rest. And if you want to know how and why, read Hebrews chapter 4. Paul says we have entered into that rest by, by who? Through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the reason why we've entered that rest. Through Jesus, we now once again have perfect presence of God in our life. We've got the fullness of God's Spirit in us. We have the protection of God in our life. Psalm 91 is a promise of protection to the modern day believer. I'd love to go into a full teaching on that and we will journey in that as a, as a church, I believe in October. Uh, but um, protection is a promise once again, and certainly provision is a promise once again. We now are provided through uh, the resource of heaven once again. We no longer labor, toil, and sweat, which is a result of the curse. Adam had perfect provision in the garden. After the garden, he had to labor, toil, and sweat as part of the curse. Jesus has reversed the curse, and we now rest in the provision of Jesus again. That is rest in a nutshell. How's the speed going? Are you keeping up with me? All right, we're going to keep going from here. I haven't even got to the chapter yet that we're going to be teaching. Uh, what I want to talk about today is rest. Now, I've already explained to you, rest is an empowerment, not a reprieve. Rest, the empowerment of the Word of God. Rest in the Word. So tap, tap your neighbor and say, rest in the Word. I want you to understand that the Word of God is an empowerment to your life. The Word of God is an empowerment to your life. It is supernaturally charged with heaven's agenda to make the promises of God come to fruition in your life. And it's empowered by the Word of God. The rest of God is coming through the Word. Now, uh, the whole sermon is, is this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the 
word, right? So if you want to grow in your faith, you grow in your word. Why? Because the word is the empowerment of your faith. So we can rest, empowerment, in the word. You see where I'm going with this? Excellent. Well, we don't need to preach the rest then. We can just pray right now. Father God, we just thank you. No. All right, let's keep going. Rest is an empowerment. So faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, I don't need you to respond to this, but I want you just to, uh, as a clarifying application, I want you to understand, if you're not in the Word, if you're not hearing the Word, if you're not reading the Word, then you will be missing in an empowerment to your faith. Now, I, I said it the, I want to say it the positive way. The positive way is that the, that the Word of God will be an empowerment to your life. But I also need you to understand the practical application of that is that if you're not in the Word, and the reason I'm saying this is because uh, it is easy in our fast-paced, rushing society to not place the Word of God as an authority and priority in your life. And it's an easy thing to do. Really easy. But if that's the case, you're lacking an empowerment for your life. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word. You want to grow in your faith, you grow in the Word. Now, I want you to understand that if you have a struggle with reading the Word of God and not understanding what it means, that's okay. Read it anyway and ask Holy Spirit to impart. And also, we can go to Kurong and we can get a whole bunch of different resources that is audio Bibles, or even forget Kurong, go jump online. There's audio Bibles, there's YouTube, you can just hear the Word of God. Just let it go. And there's different translations that you can listen to. Uh, and, you know, um, don't get too hung up on translations. Some are word for word, some are concept for concept, some are paraphrases. If you want to know more about that, I'm happy to talk you through that. But at the end of the day, what I need you to understand and what I need you to take away is that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Jesus is trying to teach this to His disciples and He often taught in parables. We're going to read one of these parables today in Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 is probably His most famous parable. It's one of the um, few parables in this particular day in Jesus' life that all three synoptic Gospels cover. It's the parable of the sower. Uh, Now, there is a suggestion and an and an estimation that there is only around about 52 days in Jesus' life of ministry that are actually recorded in the gospel, in, in the gospels. Um, so in other words, all the stories that we've read, there's really only about 52 days of active ministry out of, out of three years. Remember what John said? He said, now, if I actually told you everything that Jesus did and said and performed, it would take up like a, a fliptillion pages, yeah. right? <laughs> Well, that, that just helps you understand that. that. Even after all the parables, everything that we talked about, uh, is about 52 days of Jesus' life and ministry that's actually recorded. But this one here, the parable of the sower, is across all three synoptics. They, they, they obviously think that this is an important one. And it was probably one that he repeated on several occasions. Uh, but this is happening, this whole chapter happens on the one day. We're going to go through the whole chapter. This all happens on one day. Now, um, Jesus starts out, Mark chapter 4, in verse 3, he says, what? What's that first word? Listen. Uh, that's going to set up the chapter for you. So we're talking about the parable of the sower. We're talking about seed time, harvest time. We're talking about yielding a harvest, yield, yielding a crop. What's the first word Jesus says? Listen. Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up, but because it had no depth of earth, um, but when the sun was, was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some a hundredfold. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What was the first word he said? Listen. How did he finish it? Hear. 
I think Jesus is trying to make a point. Here we, let's, let's go on. In verse 13, he says, And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are ones sown on stony ground, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with all gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so only endure for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground, those who hear the word. So you want to know what, what makes good soil? Those who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. Notice that there was no difference in the seed, only where the seed took place or fell or penetrated. And here we see three different hearts where the seed, which in this particular parable, is the Word of God. There are three different types of hearts that are unfruitful and one type of heart that is fruitful. And often... The difference between the three hearts and the one is in the hearing. Yeah. Now, I want you to understand this, that the revelation of God's Word in your heart, because faith comes by hearing, will often lead to greater revelation, that light will lead to light. But you also need to understand the reverse of that is also true, that darkness will lead to a greater darkness. That when you're sitting under the Word of God, sitting under the teaching of God, getting revelation from the Word of God, that it will lead to greater light and revelation in your life. But if you are rejecting the Word of God, if you're letting Satan come along and steal that seed out of your heart, if you're letting the cares of this world come up and choke the Word out of your heart, or if you're just letting the, the, the basically the lust of the flesh, your own desires, to quickly spring up and then fade away, then it will then not lead to greater light, but to greater darkness. Now, we see this iterated in Romans chapter 1, where God actually says that, I'm just going to give them over to themselves. That once they start to down a certain track of pursuing darkness and rejecting my revelation, they become so dark in their own thinking that I just give them over to their own reprobate minds. Darkness will lead to greater darkness, but light will lead to greater light. Now, let's deal this on a real practical level. You will understand greater revelation of the kingdom of God once you come to know the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, the very first seed that we're talking about here is the gospel of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom. You were once in sin, in darkness, separated from God, and the seed of God's word hit your heart and it came to life. Well, light hit your life at that moment, but as you pursued that light, greater revelation came about who God is, how He operates, His characteristics, how He um, moves about the world and His plan of His kingdom being established here on earth. You journey with God for a few months, you realize that He is the Savior of your soul, but then after a few months, you realize that He's also your healer. It's a greater light, it's a greater revelation that's come to you. You journey with Him a couple more months, maybe another year, and you realize that there is a promise of protection for your family. It's a greater revelation. It's a greater light. You journey with God a little bit further and you realize that not only is He the Almighty, not only is He the, the Most High of your life, uh, but He is also the one who provides and nourishes you and sustains you and is with you in every season, that He is a friend of your soul. It's a greater light. It's a greater revelation. And so one of the main reasons why we need to stay in the Word is because light leads to a greater light. You want a greater revelation of who God is? Stay in the Word because faith comes by hearing. Let me explain it this way. I could not put this in any better terms, so I just directly am going to quote this guy. You don't really need to know who he is. He's just a Methodist theologian from England. 
Um, but I, I, could not put, I could not put his words any better. So he says this, God's self-revelation is veiled. I just want to say a quick note on that. We know God because he's revealed himself. Like we didn't discover God. It wasn't like we were walking along one day and we're like, you know what, I bet you there's a God. No, nah. God made himself known to you. That's why you know. He's revealed himself and he does that in many ways. But God has revealed himself. God's self-revelation is veiled in order that men may be left self-sufficient room, left sufficient room in which to make a personal decision. A real turning to God or repentance is made possible by the inward divine enabling of the Holy Spirit, but would be rendered impossible by the external compulsion of a manifestation of the unveiled divine majesty. The revelation is veiled for the sake of man's freedom to believe. Oh, good, you got that quote up there. I highlighted that in green, and it's really hard to read. <laughs> Don't highlight in green in future reference. This is what he's saying. It would be really easy for God to like, he's up in heaven, and he, if you're down on earth, it'd be really easy for God to be like, so anyway, I'm real. It'd be really easy. As a matter of fact, I've actually asked God about that. I'm like, God, this whole preaching thing, going to different nations and like telling people, convincing people, preaching the gospel, it's kind of hard work. Can you just like tell everyone you're real? Because in our thinking, we think that'd be, that, like, we think that'd be a better option. Like, wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be just a much better option? Hey, y'all, you better repent. Much easier than setting up churches. But see, that's our thinking. God's got a higher way of thinking. And what he is saying is that if I just come out and openly manifest myself, then I actually take away part of your freedom to actually choose to be in relationship with me. And so the Word of God does actually come thinly veiled, not because God doesn't want you to know, not because God is trying to keep a secret. He is not a secret keeper. He is an unveiler. He is a revealer. He is wanting you to discover Him. There is a journey and a privilege as a believer in humanity to discover who God is and to understand His ways and to learn the ways in which our Father runs His kingdom. That's a privilege. And He's done it through His Word. That's in two ways you can take that. First of all, he's done it through the word, Jesus Christ, who came manifest as flesh. The word manifested and became flesh and dwelt among us, yet he has also concealed himself in the pages of this book. Jesus in print. God in print, revealed to us. And so we need to look at the treasury of Scripture as a magnificent treasure hunt of God's ways, His characteristics, His promises, and His delights. It's our greatest privilege to discover who He is. And greater light will lead to greater light. That the revelation of God is never-ending. You will never, even though He's immutable, which means He doesn't change, you will never understand the fullness of God because He is so large and so magnificent, so all-encompassing and in power. We will never understand His full majesty, but oh my goodness, what a privilege it is to try. This is the revelation that God wants you to hit their heart, but there is a couple of hearts where the seed of God's Word will hit and it won't produce the harvest of 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. The first heart is that of a hard heart. It's a hard heart. And, and, and this, is, this is the heart where the Word of God hits, and it's really easy for the enemy, the devil himself, to come along and snatch that seed away. Why? Because it's a hard heart. The seed doesn't even penetrate. It just sits there on top. And it's easy for the kingdom of darkness, who rules in fear and submission, to come along and snatch that seed away. Now, this is true of unsaved people, but it's also true of saved people. That there is, in the life of a believer, a potential for there to be a hardening of the heart through either unforgiveness, through resentment, through bitterness, and, and through our own uh, religious observance in many ways, to actually harden our heart towards the greater revelation of God. 
And here's the beauty of God's freedom and liberty in which He affords us. He will give you whatever portion you desire. Now, for some of us, that may scare us. For others of us, that's a beautiful promise. Because when you're asking for more of God, when you're saying, God, reveal yourself, I want to know even more of you. I want a greater revelation of who you are. I want to know more of you. I want a greater uh, uh, pursuit of your presence. I want to pursue you relentlessly and wholly. Then God's going to say yes. But it's also possible for a believer to say, God, I like you where you are. You're my saviour. Good deal. Thanks for the golden ticket into heaven. But I just need you to stay there. I've, I've actually got enough of you. And God will say Yes. Wherever you at, whatever you desire, God allows you to decide how deep you let that seed go. The next level of heart uh, is the, the shallow heart. This is one that is very much taken up with the pursuit of consumerism, the pursuit of materialism. They're basically in love with the world and the fashions and the trimmings and the lust of the eyes, essentially, is the way the Bible puts it. The lust of the eyes. What they desire in the world is of greater value than the treasure of the kingdom of heaven. Remember I said before, this is a treasure hunt. This is the treasure. Matter of fact, Jesus even described that the kingdom of God is like a man who found a treasure in a field. Well, that's, that's you and I. That's, that, that's you and I who go after. We're like, we're forsaking all else, forsaking anything the world has to offer. We turn our back on the world and we relentlessly pursue the kingdom of God and the king of the kingdom. Amen. But see, there is a believer, there is a heart that looks at the forsaking all else and says, price tag too high. I don't want to pay all of that. I value the world too much. And so it grabs onto this and tries to go in two ways. It says, I want the seed, the harvest looks good, but because of the shallowness of their heart, it springs up quickly but then fades away. Salvation sounds good. Heaven sounds good. God coming in and blessing you abundantly, giving you the riches of heaven, blessing you with every spiritual blessing. Oh my goodness, that sounds awesome. Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> but then the preacher gets up and says, by the way, Jesus is also your Lord and you're going to need to live the way that he tells you to live. You're going to need to run your marriage the way that he tells you to run your marriage. You're going to need to run your finances the way that he tells you to run your finances. You're going to need to watch on Netflix what Jesus would watch with you on Netflix. And all of a sudden, well, uh, maybe that's too big a price tag. It's a shallow heart. And often what this ends up in is a religious superficiality of relationship instead of genuine, intimate, divine embrace. And so, how do we get from the hard heart, from the shallow heart? Well, there's, there's one more heart that we also need to make sure that we don't have, not only in salvation, but also in the life of a believer. And the third heart is the crowded heart. It's the crowded heart. It, the seed comes in, but... All the cares and the worries and the concerns of the world also grow with that seed and actually end up choking the harvest which should have been yours. Now, I explained last week, and let me reiterate, the kingdom of God operates on love. It's a kingdom of love. God is love, and it runs on faith. The kingdom of darkness is a kingdom of fear, and it runs on submission. Fear and submission. And so we always need to be asking as a believer, am I responding in faith or am I responding in fear? Because the Word of God that hits my heart is either going to flourish or get choked in my response in my heart to the Word of God, whether it's going to be in faith or in fear. See, often people think that doubt is the opposite of faith. Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. Faith is a creative force 
that partners with our Imago Day, but also fear as the opposite of faith also has that same creative power. Matter of fact, Job even gives us this lesson in his life. He says, what I have greatly feared has come upon me. Faith has a creative ability and a power that partners with your creative Imago Dei or in the image of God just as much as faith does. So we have in the Word of God, when the seed hits our heart, are we going to respond in faith or respond in fear? And it looks like this, that we read Isaiah 53 and it says that by His stripes that we are healed. We read in 2 Peter that by His stripes we were healed. It's now past tense. And then that takes root in our heart. But then we get a report. We get an experience. We get other Christians sharing with us that, yeah, uh, I knew someone who prayed those verses and they never got their healing. Well, now we've got a response in our heart that's either going to choose, is it going to be a crowded heart that gets choked out by fear or is it going to be a flourishing good soil heart that's going to produce a harvest when we see and read in scripture uh, actually God is my provider he provides everything that I could ever possibly want hope or desire that actually if I just align my heart with his heart that my dreams become his dreams and that he's going to live through me and that his thoughts are higher than my thoughts and that when I lay down my life, I'm going to discover a greater one. And so I, I, I'm going to actually just, you know, s- submit my resource and trust to God. And then all of a sudden, we see the economy, we see the report, we see our bank accounts and the credit card statements and bills come in. And then we have to decide, are we going to have a crowded out heart that's going to choke that up, that seed of faith that God provides, or are we going to respond in faith? Now, I, I'm not saying this is easy, I'm just telling you the way in which faith operates. Now, remember how we started this, faith comes by hearing, hearing and hearing by the Word. Word of God. So if this is difficult, if this is something you're struggling with, I've got good news for you this morning, all you need is a good audio Bible. Yeah. That's all you need. All you need is to turn off the TV and turn on some good preaching. All you need to do is turn off the voices that is saying, actually, no, um, God isn't that good. You're actually over-exaggerating the blessing that He has for you. And actually turn on a teacher of the Word who's actually going to say, no, the authority of Scripture is final and God really is that good. Which voice are you going to listen to will decide whether or not you have a crowded heart or a flourishing heart. Now, as much as this applies to salvation, it certainly applies... To us as believers, Jesus actually explained this to his disciples. So I want to go on. Are you ready for the rest of the chapter? You got the first part? We're going to do the second part now. This is the rest of the chapter. The rest of the chapter is he goes on. He says, light under a basket. Also, he said to them, is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears, let him hear. hear. Jesus is still talking about this hearing thing. Now, when I was reading that as a boy, I just thought that meant that my mum would discover eventually everything I did wrong. (laughs) That I would never be able to keep, uh, that everything one day is going to be revealed. And then I thought maybe that happens in heaven and like on judgment day, there's this big video screen of everything I did wrong and everyone gets to watch Every, every single, but that's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about, that once you have received the revelation of God's Word, and in broader terms, let me go macro here, that God's establishment of the kingdom, even though thinly veiled in His first, uh, in his first coming, is going to be ultimately revealed in His second coming. Jesus, in His first coming, said, um, oh, by the way, I know I healed you, don't tell anyone. Oh, by the way, I know I freed you from demons, don't tell anyone. Oh, I'm going to tell you about the kingdom of God in parables, so that thinly va- But in His second coming, kingdom revealed. Matter of fact, the book of Revelation, and my team know this, and you'll know this, my church will know this, that I'm so passionate about its revelation, not revelations, because there's only one revelation, and that is Jesus Christ, because revelation is the revealing of Jesus. That's what the book is about. It reveals Jesus. There is a day where truth will be revealed. There is a day where grace will be unveiled. There is a day where we will actually get to know Jesus' real name. Jesus actually has a name that nobody knows yet, but one day it's going to be fully revealed. 
It's Jesus. No, it's not. I'm just, just joking. I saw somebody writing that down over there. I'm just joking. It's not actually Jesus. <laughs> Jesus has a name. It's going to be revealed. But let me get back out of the macro, back into the micro. Let, let's, let's apply this. What this means, this can apply in Revelation. It can apply in activation. Or it can apply in participation. So, it, first of all, the light hits us and it's a revelation. But once we receive the revelation of who Jesus is, we don't go and hide it. We don't put it under a basket. We don't put it under a bed. No, the revealed light in us is for the sharing of the gospel. But it's also in activation that when we hear about the healing of the word, when we hear about the prosperity of the word, when we hear about the protection of the word, when we hear that actually the kingdom is to be established and to flourish in this earth, then we actually have an activation of our faith that what God said will come to pass, that God's given you a word and that word isn't to be hid under a bed or under a basket, but there is an activation to that word that will bring a flourishing to your life. But it's also an invitation to participation. It's a revelation. It's an activation. But it is also a participation that God's kingdom will be established in full. And guess what? He's asked you to be on the team that actually sees it into a fruition. That the word of God, God said, I will establish my kingdom. God said, I will bring heaven to earth. And then there is a participation that he gets asked to join in with him to establish that kingdom and to bring that heaven. It's a seed coming to harvest. It's a seed coming into a flourishing, depending on faith and the activation of our heart that God has actually given to us. It's a light that we are not meant to hide. He goes on after the light under the basket. And then he goes, he talks about, well, actually, towards the end of that, he says, take heed what you hear, take heed what you hear, with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. Hopefully you've, you've found it. Turn to verse 24. Have we got verse 24? I think I moved too quick. There we go. No, we got it there. Take heed what you hear, with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. In other words, whatever revelation you've received of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the gospel of the kingdom, what you use, either more will be given, or no more dished out. That's why it's not only just a revelation, not just an activation, but it's a participation. He goes on from there and he talks about the next parable. He talks about the parable of the growing seed. And for time, let me sum it up for you. Jesus says, this is how the kingdom of God works. The farmer comes along and he scatters seed. And then he goes home. He makes sure it's fertilized. He makes sure it's good. And then one day there's a harvest there. How it happened, he doesn't know. He just planted the seed. It was God that made the harvest come. The only thing the farmer did was turn up and harvest to recognize the season of his seed. That there is a seed time, but there is also a harvest time. I don't think Christians have a problem with seed time. I think they're real good at seed time. What I think Christians have a problem with is harvest time. Learning how to harvest their seed. And a lot of this month, we're going to be talking about how to harvest your seed. But here's here's the principle he's taking. Sow the Word of God, and it's not your job to see it come to pass. Just turn up when it does and make sure you harvest it. Just keep sowing the Word of God. Keep sowing that revelation. Keep sowing that light. And God will oversee His Word. God will oversee His Word and make sure it comes to harvest. It's not your job to oversee His Word. Psalm says that God has put His Word above His name. And that everything will come to fruition. In other words, for God to break His Word, He would have to change His name. He would literally cease being called God if He broke His Word. It's not your job to oversee His Word. You just sow the seed and turn up at harvest time. But we're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. Are you ready? And then He talks about the parable of the mustard seed. This is all in the same day. And He says this, mustard seed, very small. But it actually turns out to be such a massive harvest that even people come, or birds come and find shade in the harvest of that mustard seed. 
that the kingdom of God has been given to us, but it's not just for us, it's for our community and it's for our suburbs and it's for our nations to come and to find shelter and protection in the seed of faith that God has given us. You've been given a measure of faith. So we see in the parable of the sower that your heart determines your harvest. We see in the parable of seed that the laws of the kingdom will always produce a harvest. And we see in the parable of the mustard seed that no matter how small the word, some of you got a small word from God and you're hanging on to that small word. And you're like, God, I'm not sure I'm going to see that word come to pass because the circumstance I'm looking at looks much bigger than my seed. Let me tell you that the seed, no matter how small is the word, it grows into the greatness of His kingdom. But this is how I want to finish. Jesus just did a whole bunch of teaching and he wouldn't have done it in 31 minutes like I just did. He would have taken all day. And he's not just some rookie pastor from Bean Lee. He's the Messiah teaching this, right? So the Messiah taught all day on seed time, hearing the Word of God, hearing some good teaching, applying it in faith, and seeing your harvest come to pass. And then he says, right, let's go to the other side. And they get in a boat, same day, same day, same teaching. They get in a boat, and Jesus is asleep. And wind and the waves started picking up, and a massive storm came. And the disciples just started freaking out. They're like, oh my goodness, we're going to die. And so they wake up Jesus and they even give him a rebuke. They're like, how can you be sleeping when we're about to die? Don't you care that we're about to perish? Not smart, not smart. And this is what Jesus says. He says, why are you so fearful? Is it that you have no faith? Now let me back up and explain the play here. Jesus has spent all day teaching on faith, seed time and harvest time that the Word will come to fruition. No matter how small, no matter how great, it's not your job to oversee it. God will oversee His Word and it will come to pass. They get in a boat after Jesus, the Word Himself, says, we're going to the other side. A storm stirs up. And all of a sudden, the disciples are like, Jesus' words are not going to come to pass. Now, that's easy from us in our 2000, you know, uh, hindsight view in our lounge chairs to judge the disciples. But what I want to pray over and stand with you today are those words that Jesus has given you. But there's a storm in your life right now, and you're worried and you're fearful instead of standing in the faith and the word that you've been given from God. How do we feed our faith? How do we feed that seed? How do we water that seed? How do we harvest that seed? How do you do it? Hearing the word of God. Some of us, we just need to remind ourselves of the promises of God. Some of us just need to remind ourselves of what he's actually said. Some of us just need to do a bit of a dig into Scripture, a deep dive into Scripture. What does Jesus actually say? Some of us might need to position it in authority because maybe we, we, maybe we haven't put God in His rightful place and that haven't placed the Word of God as the ultimate authority of our lives. But maybe some of us are letting the concerns of life choke out those words. But I'm going to talk to the believers this morning. I want to remind you that when we stand on the Word, you're going to get a harvest of 30-fold. You're going to get a harvest of 60-fold. You're going to get a harvest of 100-fold. Why? Because God oversees His Word. And we're just going to keep hearing the Word of God, standing in faith and believing that Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, and remind ourselves of His promises. Remind ourselves of the Word of God. And then we're going to look at the storm. And we're not going to be moved by the storm. We're going to be just like Jesus. He said, peace, be still. Why? Because He knew what the Word of God says.